Hey everyone, and welcome back to Behind the Space Bar. Behind the Space Bar is a podcast for musicians, music directors, playback techs, really anyone performing on stage with Ableton Live. So if that is you, you're in the right place. If that's not you, well, welcome. You're you're invited to listen in, to hang out. Uh, today is going to be a very, very practical episode. Sometimes we're a little more philosophical. A couple weeks ago we were. We talked about, um, uh, I forgot what we talked about now. It was so long ago. Uh, but uh, today is a very practical, tactical episode that relates perfectly to using tracks on stage. Even if you're a little more advanced, stick with me. I'm going to do my best to get through these quickly, um, and they're going to transform your show. Today, we're talking about five ways to improve your transitions when using Click and Tracks Live. This is something I'm incredibly passionate about because I was a guitar player. I was a musician, a music director before I started playing tracks. And uh, particularly when I was in Florida and South Florida, working with bands and uh, as a music director, as a teacher, instructing bands at, um, at a school there. This was something that I saw bands struggle with. Uh, and when it comes to transitions, sometimes all our transitions are, are do a song, stop, start a next song. And sometimes that's perfectly fine. Like based on the context of what you're doing, that's that's perfectly fine sometimes. Um, but transitions are really kind of this these magical moments in between songs that uh, you can spend in time and focus on that are really going to transform your set and, and make it you know go from just uh, disparate, separate individual songs to a, a complete moment. Um, this is something in the the church worship community that we spend a lot of time uh, talking about, or, or it's something we sometimes or pretend to spend a lot of time and importance on, but then sometimes we just simply rely on, let's use a drone pad to transition us from this song to the next. Uh, that's an L, a way you can improve your transition. That's actually not one of the tips I'm going to share today, um, but I see this happen so often with bands. Uh, whether it's a, a church worship situation or not, it, it doesn't matter. But bands that are particularly playing with clicks and tracks, Let, let's not just say in general bands that are playing on stage, but bands that are playing on stage with click and tracks. So often I can tell immediately the bands that are performing with click because the singer speaks, they, they're, they're, you know, welcoming the crowd. They're saying, we're so thankful to be here. And then at the end of the speech, they go, all right, let's sing this song. And if you're not watching the video, I turned around and nodded my head. The singer nods their head. The entire band looks down or the entire band turns and looks at the drummer. Nothing's happening. They wait for about five to seven seconds. And then they all suddenly start playing. And everyone kind of in the audience is like, what the heck is happening? Like, what's wrong with these people? They're like in a completely different world than we are. It's like this kind of Doctor Strange multiverse of madness thing where the audience is in one multiverse or one universe and the bands in another universe and they're disconnected and it's like what the heck is happening i see that happen so often uh with bands that are using click and track so today i'm going to share five tips again for those of you worship folks i'm not talking about drone pads um we're talking about folks that are using click and tracks on stage how to improve transitions again even if you're a pro listen because these are going to help and benefit you uh greatly so let's get into our five uh ways to improve your transitions when using clicks and tracks number one think of transitions from the audience's perspective i just kind of gave away the, the main uh structure of of today's I about called it workshop it kind of feels like a workshop essentially these are mini workshops i mean it's a good way for me to describe these podcasts because i like just getting you content really quickly. Okay, shut up, Will. Get back to the point. Think of transitions from our audience perspective. It really, it does often feel like the band and the audience are, are in two different universes. And again, if you're a worship leader listening to this and I say the term audience, just substitute congregation. You know what I'm talking about here. Don't comment and say, you know, whatever. Uh, you're, you're all good good people. We can all get along and, and work out here. Um, again, I see this happen no matter the context that I, I'm in. I've been to big shows where a band will do a song and then they get done. And it typically, this is the moment that typically happens. I talked about it earlier. The lead singer uh, is is introing a song. They're talking about something. They give the head nod. It takes a couple seconds. The song starts. Sometimes that's good because it's intentional and it builds anticipation. But more often than not, it's just because we're in the moment talking, not thinking. So think about transitions from the audience perspective. If you're planning beforehand, which I mean, that should be a tip. I don't have that in here. You should actually plan your transitions. But if you're thinking about it beforehand, think about count ins, think about click tracks. Here's what I suggest. The audience isn't going to hear that or they shouldn't. If you set everything up properly, the audience isn't hearing your click tracks or count ins. So think about the fact the audience isn't hearing that. So when you start a song, you're not starting a song. You're starting a song two measures before the song starts because right, you have click, you have count in. At least I hope you have some sort of count in so everyone comes in together and then you start the song. The audience is just hearing the song. So your transition needs to basically be two bars earlier than you need the 
audience to start hearing the song. Does that make sense? So think about your transitions from the audience perspective. Um, I often say mute the click track when you're creating your transition, nudge things over, then bring the click track in. And as long as it's uh, particularly for like tying two songs together, as long as the band can follow the click track starting, that's a reason to use guide cues or, or, or slate tracks to have a count off, particularly at the beginning of a song. As long as the band can follow that, then that's going to be fine. I've worked with someone before that they literally in the middle of a song wanted the band to play at one tempo and a completely different other tempo to start and then them to transition. And it wasn't like a gradual thing. It was just like 180 and then suddenly well, it was at 180. Uh, it's not a metal band. It's like 120 and then suddenly uh, 135. And then one of the band just suddenly start playing at that. There was no counting. There was nothing. They just did it. Um, it didn't translate well because the band couldn't do that. So it was an impossible transition, but tying two songs together, think about the transition from the audience perspective, mute the count in, mute the click track, get the transition right when you're just listening to it and then unmute those elements, make sure the band can follow. Number two, have a trigger word to start tracks. Um, here's the key to that. A lot of times we have this, but that trigger word needs to be, you know, let, let the lead vocalist lead singer um, have the space to talk for as long as I want to, the band can vamp behind him or whatever. Um, uh, but work out the last two measures of what the person is going to say. And what I mean by that is can think about your transition. You have the full song before you have about two measures of a count in work with, uh, the person that's talking, work with the artist. If you're in a church situation, work with the MC or the pastor or figure this out and go, okay, what's the last two measures of what you're going to say? And I know that's weird, but, um, cause they're not speaking to click. Um, but work out the last two measures of the phrase to where if their phrase says, so we're so excited to be here, let's sing this song together, whatever that is. Um, you know, that last phrase, that trigger word, we're so excited to be here. That's the trigger word based on the tempo. They're going to say it a certain way. And then in their ears, they're going to be, they're going to hear one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Um, someone who's aware that's a really good, particularly artist. Let's talk about an artist situation. They should be hearing click and cues because they can time out what they're saying to where they say, we're so excited to be here. Click starts one, two, they pause for a second. So let's sing the song together. And then the band cranks in immediately when they say, let's sing the song together. Boom. We're in as opposed to, we're so excited to be here. Let's sing this song together. Boom. Right. That's awkward. It's awkward for me just sitting here in silence, staring at the cameras. I feel like I'm staring into your soul and I know all your deep, dark secrets. You watching this. Yes. You, I'm talking about you. Um, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's not intentional. Uh, uh, if it's meant to be there and it's intentional, great, but most of the time it's not. So have the trigger word, spend some time with the artist, with the person that's speaking to time that out where, you know, if your count is one measure, um, great. If it's two measures, figure that out so that when they say that word, you've got that amount of time left to kick into the song. Number three, create transitions, uh, where songs automatically flow into each other. I called these when I was at multitracks.com. We were teaching a lot on transitions. We were literally creating um, uh, uh, like transitions in our app. We were rewriting the audio engine so we could have one song transition to another. And I'm pretty sure we called one of the transitions flow. Maybe not. Maybe that's loop community. But we talked about this flow transition, which was this idea of a song ends and then immediately kind of flows into the next one. So instead of like do do boom boom or kind of trash can do do boom and we're into the next one, it would be like. And you're right into the next one, right? Sorry for my air drumming and bad examples. But essentially, song one never really ends, or the end of song one is the immediate start of song two. That's going to take some monkey business to mess with the tempo, maybe mess with um, uh, the key to make those songs flow. Here's a pro tip I don't think every single one of your songs should just flow. I know a lot of churches, this again, I think last week's episode, was it last week or maybe the, the episode before that? It was two episodes ago. I was picking on worship leaders and church folks. I'm going to pick on you again. Um, one of my pet peeves is going to a church where probably the worship leader is a little younger and their opening set of songs is like, um, you know, two to three songs and it just flows immediately. Like there's no space. There's no space to let things settle. Um, you know, that's, that's not always the best choice. Now, that being said, um, I've mentioned a few times we were at NAM this past week, um, and, uh, my wife and I, and we went to the night of worship that Yamaha put on Fred Hammond was there and the band did, I want to say 10 to 12 songs like at the beginning and they never stopped playing, but their transitions were so good. The musicianship was unreal, unbelievable. Fred Hammond's an incredible, uh, performer, worship leader, but, um, their transitions just flowed from one song to the next, but then there were times 
where he gave it space and he let a song die down and it was intentional. So that first set was high energy and it was just hit after hit after hit. Emotionally, it was like freaking amazing. The songs are incredible, but then there was space. So let there be space that it needs to. But when at all possible, I see this a lot with, um, I think worship bands get this better. Again, that's why I'm picking on worship leaders here. They get this better, but sometimes they do fall to that more. I see bands that um, are out on the road traveling. They're playing their album songs, and they just do one song in, one song in, one song in. Take some time to let songs flow together. Take like um, a new song and flow into an old song at the end. Like Just make it an experience. Go beyond just doing a song and making an emotional experience. That leads me to perfect transition to number four. Uh, produce remix transition elements. What I mean by that is, Let's say a song ends, you're about to go into a big hit and you can chop out the chorus of that hit song. You could do like a filter sweep where the filters close and it slowly, slowly opens and you could have a four on the floor kick going. Uh, you could have a, a transition that you walk out to that's kind of a remix thing. Basically anyone with any creativity or knowledge of basic electronic music production principles or the ability to watch any YouTube video to say, how can I quickly transition, transform this song? We'll be able to figure this out, right? It doesn't take tons and tons of skill. Um, what's great though, if this is intentional and this is important to you, what you can do is hire a producer, hire someone who's really good at doing remixes and either hire them to remix your song or hire them to say, create a remix that then flows into the song. It needs to be in this key at this tempo and they can create this incredible kind of remix type thing. Then you lay that in your timeline in Ableton and automatically transition into your song. Again, these are the things that I love using click and tracks for is they create these emotional moments, these moments that take a song from the studio to the stage and are not just pressing play and playing with tracks. Sometimes we think that's all it is. There's so much more to that. Number five, um, use clicking cues to time out blackouts with light. So perfect example of this, and I, I meant to make a, a, a link to do this, so I'll, I'll do this. Um, I just did a video, I believe it was two weeks ago. It was before name, if I remember correctly. Um, by the time you're watching this, it was many, many weeks ago, but a link to walking through what an in-ear mix sounds like. Um, I'm going to make a note here so that I make sure to put this in the show notes. I can't type and talk at the same time, so I got to pause to do that. Uh, but one of the examples I used, I didn't really realize it when I pulled this example up. I was looking for examples. I found an in-ear mix from Corey Wong, who was playing with, was it Ben Rector, I think, was, was who he was playing with. Um, and I, I pulled this up. And, uh, and Corey's a great guitar player, just killer, killer player. Um, and so it was cool to hear his in-ear mix, but I realized as I was watching it, um, in the moment, actually watching it live on the video that, um, they had timed out a blackout of light. So they do a song, the lights drop out. And then, um, uh, the lead singer, which again, I believe was Ben Rector switches from piano to acoustic guitar, grabs acoustic guitar. And then what you hear in just the clicking guide lights are out, you hear one, two, three, four. And then the band without any counting, there's no tss, 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 and then they start, there's nothing. So the audience, it builds anticipation. It's their first song. They play a little intro thing, lights drop, blackout drops, and then one, two, three, four, and then poof, lights pop back up. Now that's really simple. You just get the lighting director, uh, you know, guide cue, click track so they can hear it, or you use time code to automate that. But what was great is again, it's taking just a song. They do that song on the record. Um, and maybe on the record, it goes from a low thing to a big thing. Well, they build that anticipation. It's the first song. That's what a great artist does. That's what a great music director does is takes a song from where it was in the studio and goes, how can we translate this to the stage? Again, it's not just about, I need to do an episode on this. It's not just about taking stems and just playing them back on stage. It's like, we have this access to this great content. How can we use this to transform this song, to take it to a whole nother level emotionally? That's what all this is about. This is why we do all of that. So tip number four, uh, tip number five, rather, to improve your transitions when using click and tracks is use click and cues, in this case, to time out blackout. So you can get to a section of a song here, one, two, three, four, shoop lights go out, the audience is going crazy, and then one, two, three, four, boom, bands back in, right? Drummer hits the cymbals, everyone's in together, lights come back up. That just creates an emotional moment that's so much more powerful than if lights go out, you know, a couple beats late, and then you hear tss, 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 
right? That's not building anticipation because the audience knows exactly what's happening. But when it's completely quiet, they got no clue when the band's going to come back and they all hit together. Uh, it's a magical, magical moment. So those are five ways to improve your transitions when using click and tracks. I hope these are beneficial to you. If you're just getting started with using click and tracks, uh, do me a favor, head to from studiostage.com slash free uh, from studiostage.com slash free. Uh, you could download all the free resources that I have there to help you get started, get up and running with using tracks. If you listen to this podcast for a while now, do me a favor, give me a, a leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts that really helps us rise up in the charts. Um, and then if you're listening over on YouTube and you haven't subscribed yet, um, if you listen to a few episodes, if you like it, do me a favor, hit subscribe, hit the bell icon so you're notified when I post new content. I do that every single day. It's crazy. It's nuts. All I do is record content every single day, 10 a.m. Central and uh, behind the space bar goes live 10 a.m. Central every Monday. Thank you guys so, so much. I did this a couple weeks ago, but uh, I am full time with from studio to stage and it's only because of uh, you kind, generous folks are listening to what I'm saying, watching what I'm saying. Um, and it really, really is a blessing. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great week, everybody. Bye.